Good evening, Virginia Beach. It's great to be here. And um, I wish to share with you a journey that I'm on. I started this journey in earnest about 16 years ago, working in approximately 200 towns every year. I'm now up to over 3,000 communities, all of which are building themselves around the theme of walkability. And what you will see in the next few minutes is a concept that is as old as civilization itself. That every street that we ever build from here on out will be remade. It will be a street that we fall in love with, that will make money. Indeed, it sets the stage for new prosperity. That any streets that are just left vacuous or vacant, same with a main street or anything, is not going to perform well enough to be taken care of. We are in some of the most exciting times for our nation in terms of economics, but also in terms of where we're trying to get to. So whether we're talking about a strip center, or just an ordinary street, or a main street, we're going to see some phenomenal transformations that will occur. And every time we do this, we're going to increase the net value or the net worth of all of the land within walking distance of that place. So the big question comes up, how in the world will we fund the remake of a street like this? The point will be that until we remake that street, this is nothing more than a, a giant uh, mechanism to move traffic from the center of somebody's town out to the burbs, and it won't pay for itself. It's only the remake of itself of this kind of a street that will allow us to regenerate the kinds of income, the kinds of saturation of land use that will work. But when I talk about walkability, it is so important that we understand that there has never been a person that we know of that's been born that didn't have that desire to one day take to their own mobility, their own movement by foot. Uh, this is my young uh, grandson, Jack, uh, just truly uh, hours before he was finally able to release himself from a little thing he could hold on to, to have his mobility, his, his ability to move the locomotion that every person dreams of until they actually go out and do it. Walking is also the last thing any person wants to give up in their life. It's how we support walking and make it the easy thing to do that's going to allow us to have people who are physically fit, socially interactive, and to be alive. We can go back to times as early as Socrates and other early eras in medicine and find that back then we knew there would never be any medication, any prescription that could ever be written that could be more assuring of health, human health, than the ability to stay mobile, to develop an active transportation system, and to be able to engage with other people. We know this from almost any direction we take in science, that when people give up their mobility, they give up on most of the things that matter to them in life. But we've done a lot in our country to discourage walking. Uh, indeed, uh, although these are incredibly laughable conditions, uh, they're too easy to photograph today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey that I'm on. I started it uh, oh, way back. But uh, what I really want to do is to lay down my credentials uh, to basically explain that uh, I'm, I'm not an architect, landscape architect, engineer, or planner. I don't do those things. I'm a photographer. And what photographers must learn to do if they're going to be successful is to learn how to see. And that's all I do is to teach other people how to see. There's a saying among National Geographic photographers that the Life magazine photographers will stand in the... Uh, uh, flower beds to photograph garbage, where uh, the National Geographic photographers will stand in the garbage to photograph 
the flowers. So it's what we see and what we want to get across to people that I'm really going to talk about. And uh, most people refer to me as the nation's optimist. I am. I believe that we can transform anything. So for example, and I see a scene like this, we, we're all very clear that uh, this may not be the place we want our child to, to walk through. Am I right about that? So what would we change? Very quickly, we would, we would put in sidewalks or crossings, or both. But then we would also, in order to make this a, 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 an attractive place, add in the trees, places to sit. But there's still something missing. The most critical part, in fact, is missing. We could deal without the sidewalks or the crosswalks, or maybe without the trees, but we have to have the third thing, and that is we have to have buildings that watch over the park. People will not come to a park until the buildings behave, until they address the street and create the protection of uh, uh, being viewed so that the right activities take place in the park, in the schoolyard, on the street. So everything we do is based on that. So when we go out and we take walking audits, we're basically looking through the lens of somebody else's eyes and and, and hopefully doing this with a multidisciplinary group where everybody learns to speak the language together, the vocabulary, so that they can go forth and design things that make sense. And it is amazing how much you learn on a 40 minute or, or a two hour walk. It's just absolutely uh, inspiring. Now, we don't have enough time in this short presentation to get into tools in a big way. What we do have time, as uh, the saying here goes, is to develop for each of you a longing that we build real neighborhoods, real streets. Once you understand that, you'll find the staff, the consultants, the, the, the ideas among yourselves that you will put those pieces together. And you will not make big mistakes. So I want to give you assurance that that's true. So let's start by talking about who designed and laid out Key West. It was a long time ago. Who laid out and designed Key West? Whoops, that went backwards. Sorry about that. Yeah, pirates. On average, how many years of design school did the pirate go to? That's my point. Everyone, when they used to use common sense, could lay out a town. Now, this area of Key West is only 20% of the land mass. It makes 80% of the money. The other portion of Key West, let me see if I can get this to work correctly, it looks like this. It's 80% of the land mass, and it only makes 20% of the money. The streets don't drain. The seawall has not been properly maintained since Hemingway used to walk there. What do you do when you get off of this bus? Best bet, swim to Cuba. <laughs> but what does this arrow mean? <laughs> the point I want to make is that if all we do is follow guidelines, we won't build our cities correctly. We have to work from the heart. We have to use common sense if, it, if we're really to build cities that work. So let's use common sense. Why are all the people that we see where they are? It's a hot place, so they look for shade. They, they want to survive. That's common sense. But we may, when we review our street codes or guidelines on city making, have failed to think about proper levels of shade. And it is so simple. But we wouldn't have made that mistake 50 or 80 years ago before we write uh, wrote all of our guidelines and, and books and things like that. I want to also share with you why I'm on this journey. It's, it's very arduous. I work roughly 340 days a year. Not many people do. And many friends tell me that when I complete my journey, I will have traveled to and worked in more communities than any other person in the history of the earth. And I think that's going to be true. What set me in motion was reading a book John Steinbeck travels with Charlie, the story of he and his pet poodle Charlie traveling across America. At the time, John Steinbeck knew he wouldn't live 
much longer. He was 58, and he didn't. He died around 60 or 61, 62. It was in that book, toward the end of the book, when John Steinbeck wrote a paragraph that has stayed with me forever. He basically said, America is out of sync with its values. We say we're for children, we're for beauty, a trees, green, all these things we say we're for. It's not what we're building. And indeed, all we have to do is travel down a road, look out the car that we're sitting in, look to our right, and realize what we've forgotten. We forgot our people. And that's what we have to get. So if we really, really want to build an America that is so strong, so vital, that uh, everyone is proud to live in it and able to make it work, then we've got to think of people first. Now to prove this, I'm going to use some cartooning. This is from my good friend Ian Lockwood, who, um, if you'll put yourselves back in the 1400s, back with Galileo, Copernicus, is everybody in looking at this description of the solar system, realize this is correct. Everything, the sun included, rotates around the earth. Am I right, folks? This is the 1400s? Yeah, of course this is correct. Anything else would be heresy. And indeed, back in those years, Gal Galileo was led through the, through the uh, torture chambers because he had this other idea, mathematically, that something else had to be or else nothing would work. So he came up with this concept. Oops. And basically, today we know this is true. I don't know why it's doing that, but it is. So what we now know is if we go fast forward to today, that the economy of our country, and am I right about this, folks, is totally centered around the automobile. And that's just the way it is, and it works, and don't touch that. But what if it's not true? And here comes a heretical statement, if I've ever heard one, and I'll make it. This will cause the ruin of any great nation. Once we get a people-centered concept, everything will pencil out. And indeed, and I don't know why this is doing this, but let's, let's see if we can get it to go back. Is there something uh, that's controlling this other than me? <laughs> um, so in a nutshell, once we get everything scaled to the human foot, we will be able to build things we can afford to build, we can afford to sustain, and they will make big money. But we have to get there. Now to further set the stage, it's important to understand that uh, cities were, were really invented beyond defense for one big thing, and that was trade. I boil it down to the word exchange, but it's more than just the exchange of our service products and goods, our jobs, it's also the exchange of our culture, our history, our friendship, our ideas, our knowledge, our wisdom, our passion. And that truly is why we are building cities and why they have to be designed to maximize those things. They also were designed to minimize travel. And for 50, 60, 70, 80 years, we got those confused, and we did just the opposite. We minimized exchange, and we maximized the amount of time we spend in travel. So when we look at what people really wish to do, and they're summed up with this kind of a set of images, that if people linger in a place, that's a positive sign. If we see lots of discussions occurring, children exploring things, people sitting down and drawing, all these things are really telling us that we've got the design correct. And that's what I look for when I go out into your communities. And if I can see people getting married uh, by foot uh, and so on, that's an extra bonus point. Uh, where people are being nice to dogs and people jog by and uh, are talking about giving directions out. That's all what we're really talking about. I think it's important, though, to point out if people are to be happy, they need to be with other people. There are some exceptions. There are people that just 
don't fit into society and they want to live somewhere else, but that's okay. But the great bulk of people want to be part of a society and they want to share and we need to design our buildings, our streets and everything so that happens naturally. But we may also need to change our vocabulary. What are all of these people doing? All five of the people we've circled, what are they all doing in common? No, they're loitering. These people are loitering. <laughs> See, in our country, we invented a word to describe something that was very negative in connotation. Now, of course, you got it right. These people come to be seen by others and to see others. This gives people pleasure. And we need good, well-designed places if this is to happen naturally. And if it doesn't happen naturally, then we've missed out on what the purpose of design is all about. Now, one of these sidewalks is absolutely packed with people. The other one is not. So as an observer, what I try to do is figure out why is one packed and the other one void. And it truly is a matter of design. Once we get the design right, this should be our ultimate measure, that we have trouble even moving through the crowd because it's so intense. That's what every community wants. That, what, that is what drives the engine of any economy, that people are coming, they're spending time. Uh, by the way, both of these scenes are the same sidewalk, the same street, Colorado uh, Boulevard in Pasadena. One area is richly detailed and nicely laid out, and the other one is still a work in progress. So I think you can see the difference. And uh, note that, uh, okay, once we finally get to this level, then we are able to give ourselves a very high scorecard. It's important to see this from a sketch view that the, the concept that we've been evolving or developing in our country for a long time is low density. We had the land, we had the money, we lacked common sense. And we then had to respond with engineering to build big, powerful roads, expensive roads. Now, if you follow through this scenario, and you can go as far as you want, but I would suggest at least get to scenario C, walkable neighborhoods, you can see the roads are much narrower and much more affordable. But then, of course, you could do uh, light rail, transit-oriented design, and have true villages, and then you uh, end up with even more open space, more protected land, and more of all the things people would like to see uh, stay in their community. So it's a choice. We either pick a lifestyle or a system that we've had in the past, and or we come up with a more intensive land use, and now be able to leave open more farmland for those who want it, and uh, more uh, open space in general, and still have all the single ha family stock, but really now give people another choice. And our new demographics, the way that we're moving in our country, and very fast, is really we need a lot more dense housing in order to support where our new populations are going to reside. But we also need to build place. I'm not gonna mention the name of this town, it'll, it'll remain nameless, but, uh, does everybody see we've got too much paving? <laughs> what if we do what Monterey did, and you can see the old curb line, can't you? By just recapturing that amount of physical space and putting it into a public realm, we can now support two, three, four little stores. And these stores, by the way, are typically open from as early as 6 in the morning until 11 at night. Here's the key point. Once this was done, the value of every home within a five-minute walk went up significantly in value. People want to live near public space, and they're willing to invest more money to live in such a space, which means that's what's really going to pencil out in the future. So when we, when we take a look at any place, we're looking at how do we reclaim it for an infill project, for um, just basically bringing back the life having a few small little stores, a bicycle store, bike rental perhaps, mailboxes, uh, uh, a bakery, a coffee house, that's all it really takes to really activate such a little space. Okay, now it, it's going to be quiz time. We're, and again, we're talking about common sense. 
Which United States president laid out Alexandria, Virginia? George Washington. George was a surveyor. Now, George never made it to college. Um, his dad died, uh, and, and George never made it into the higher academia. But the point is, he knew how to lay out streets. He knew how, what size blocks ought to be. Because it was nothing but common sense, and there were many great models in Europe and other places to choose from. And so truly, one of the most prosperous cities in all of Virginia was laid out by a president that never attended college. Now we can see that principle almost anywhere. This is just your average town in Florida, uh, Fort Pierce, Florida, uh, circa, we can tell by the steam paddler, a long, long time ago. We'll focus in on one building, and, but notice the orientation of the streets. And from this building, over time, because people were asleep at the switch, they didn't use common sense, this is what became a Fort Pierce. About 20 years ago, Fort Pierce got together, crafted a vision, and has been working on that vision ever since, and this is what Fort Pierce is now becoming, and it's very close to completion. The point is, if you end up with good bones from the get-go, you can reshape, reform, bring back to life a city, no matter how much we've abused it. So Fort Pierce is a great example of a very poor community in Florida that has really gotten its act together and is now making good money. We can do that anywhere. This is Tampa, Florida, um, right at the base of this uh, photo is a good neighborhood. It's, it's not a wealthy neighborhood, but it, it's in a good location near the downtown. And a development will come in here. The point is, if you were George Washington, how would you lay out this new community? What would you do? How would you orient your streets? Exactly. And build your streets to the water. And by doing that, you hold the full value of all of the homes further back because people now have direct access to the water. They can see the water. And now uh, they have access to the trails around the water. You don't privatize the water. You make that a public commodity. And by doing that, you increase the value of all land. What did this developer fail to do? connect to the water. And as a result, he devalued every one of the yellow lots, devalued all of his land. Now, if you did connect, the argument might be that the, the lake properties won't be worth as much. That's a myth. Those lake properties are worth a fortune because they're the only lake properties. They're going to sell very, very well. But you need to increase the value of all lots and give everyone access to the prize, the waterfront in this case. Now, designing for a city takes a little bit of science. James Perry, once the automobile came into existence, around 1928, laid out this model for a town. The Depression hit, so very, very few of James Perry's concepts ever were built, but he got it right where he put the buildings, where he organized the streets, the alignments, everything was almost flawless. And in a, a little bit, I'm going to show you how a town that is now being celebrated was basically laid out exactly this way in the 1990s. Now, before going any further, though, I want to uh, uh, open with a couple of stories. I'm going to start with a story of the two wolves, the Cherokee Indian Nation, Obviously, you can read for yourself, but in a nutshell, uh, the grandfather is explaining to the, to the youngster that there are two wolves that live inside all people. One is a good wolf and is always thinking of good, positive, joyful things to add to the community, to, to their family, to everyone. But there's also an evil wolf, and this is, there's no exception. Everybody has an evil wolf. So in the end... The grandson says, well, which wolf wins? Whichever one you feed. It's so simple. 
So let's tell a few stories. Uh, here is a community. What did they forget if they want healthy people? Sidewalks. sidewalks. Now, if you really look at it though, the sidewalks are there. They're on the wrong side of the street. They are on the side of the street where no one will complain. But how do you get across the street? So you really haven't built for your children, for your seniors, or even for your most able-bodied citizens. But I will say that we have so many folks that now take control and will stop almost anything of good, of quality, that we have to fear ourselves. That, to me, is the evil wolf coming out. Not in front of my house, you won't. Not on my block, you won't. We're not thinking community. That's an evil wolf. Now, we'll go forward and tell some more stories. One of these uh, is more dense. There's more units per acre than the other. And uh, I'm going to guess that uh, the one on the left conforms to a local standard, but it's ugly. Am I right about that, folks? That's very, very ugly. So people get together and they say, we don't like density. Well, that's not density. The one on the right is more dense. See, we're arguing about the wrong things. We shouldn't be arguing about density. We should be arguing about form. And if we love the form, then we give ourselves permission to build the form. And it's so important to understand what it is that we don't like and, and really get our heads around that to have that vocabulary and say, we don't like bad form, we like good form, and we don't care what the density is as long as it works and, and it supports what we're trying to achieve. So these are the important things. It's also important for me to tell a few more stories, and in this case I'm going to share with you, uh, having been brought down to Captiva Island in Florida when I was the state bicycle coordinator, uh, and as I was being driven down the corridor, we were looking at putting a trail on, I asked why the white balloons were there. And they explained to me, well, Dan, the balloons are here for you. The people with the white balloons want the trail. So I asked, is there more to this story? And they said, yes. On Monday, when the public works director came down, all the balloons that were up were black. It turns out there were 50-50. Half of the balloons were white, half were black. So this is what we call a conflicted community. Uh, polarized. So I said, okay, I can't help you. And I really couldn't help them. But then, with an idea, I said, I can help you help yourselves. Pick 12 of your best citizens, make sure they represent both sides of the issue, and we'll teach them how to be planners. They studied, they figured it out, and they went and laid out a master plan based on the fact that they collected the data and they were able to sell the concept and get a 99% involvement rate of the entire island and got a 96% approval rate to go forward. See, I couldn't have done that. I'm an outsider. You have to live in the neighborhood and you have to have leaders in the neighborhood or develop the leaders as we did in order to put in the trail. Now the other story is, is even more bizarre. This is the Cook Inlet up in Anchorage and uh, the uh, person behind the fence is a very powerful person who did not want the trail. He fought the trail. Everybody thought he would win, but the community banded together and said, no, we need this trail. And uh, so in the end, the people won. And when you hear who lives behind that fence, it may come as a surprise. The person who is most responsible for getting Alaska its statehood, who was the governor of Alaska, who was the Secretary of the Interior under Nixon, and who's considered the father of the environmental movement that the world enjoys, Walter Hickel. In everybody, there is a bad wolf. Now, here's the fun part of the story. Once the fence was up, he put the gate in, and every night he was out jogging up and down his trail. And uh, I think he felt very guilty, but the point is, in the end, the good wolf won.
The woman you see holding the can is a Jamaican woman who migrated to the United States that uh, very sadly a child was killed in the street in front of her house. And in tears she went and grabbed this can, walked door to door, and contacted all of her neighbors and collected $2,500. And then she approached a charity and they matched it with another $2,500, so she was up to $5,000. They then took it to the city, the city matched it, and now we're up to uh, 10000 and then came to us. We said we will contribute a lot of our services, and now they had $20,000 to put together a master plan, and very recently, uh, the entire project was funded to the tune of about a quarter of a million dollars. That's the good wolf, and that's what every American is capable of producing. The woman that you see here, escorted by two other teachers, is uh, helping her community, Bend, Oregon, become a better place. These are first graders. And the first graders are being led around and they sit down in various places and they draw their city. They're learning urban design at a very young age. This is the good wolf. This is what it takes to build a great community. But this may be the most profound story of all. One day I was driving through the back uh, hills of California, came upon this group. They were building a trail. I thought that's pretty darn good. So after I finished getting all my photographs, I stopped and I asked them, I said, how did you get started doing this? This is a marvelous thing that you're doing. And they said, well, our city ran, or our county ran out of money. They couldn't maintain our streets. Our streets got so decrepit that the post office refused to deliver our mail. So they banded together, formed a nonprofit organization to protect themselves, learned how to patch their street, fixed it up, got the mail delivered again, but in the process, they fell in love with working for positive things together. And so every weekend now, they look for ways to go out and rebuild a part of their community. This is something we are all capable of. Once you turn that spigot on, you cannot turn it off. We're going to have a lot of friends, a lot of support along the way. The um, uh, film crew you see here is, is capturing 15 minutes of uh, my skill set, how to lead walking audits. And, uh, and truly, this is going to be part of a five-hour set of documentaries that will be released by uh, public television uh, starting the first of the year to really show how we need to rebuild our built environment if we're to have healthy people again. And, uh, and we need this. These by, folks, by the way, are the uh, original film crew for uh, the Woodstock movie. We're all aging gracefully, wouldn't you say? And uh, another person I want to celebrate is the gentleman I'm shaking hands with, Dan Butner, who wrote the book Blue Zones, which uh, identifies and researches the hot spots where people live longer on the planet. What kind of environment creates longevity? And after he did that and found out there were some basic rules you could follow to do that, uh, he's more recently released a new book called Thrive. It's a book on the happiness hot spots on our planet, where people are much happier, not a little, but much happier than other people uh, in a different city or a different state or a different country. And Dan asked me to come to Albert Lee, Minnesota to put together the notions or concepts for how to make uh, Albert Lee a place where people live longer. So I got to be the interventionist for the built environment. Someone else came in and, and dealt with nutrition. Someone else with lifestyle. Someone else with purpose in life. If you add those four together, you can increase the lifespan of almost all human beings. And uh, so we experimented, uh, beautiful results, added 10,000 years of life to Albert Lee, and uh, now we're getting ready to take this to more cities. So these are good notes that we're realizing and discovering how to transform our cities into healthier, uh, better places. But if we're to do this, we also have to understand 
happiness. Does everybody see the bottom line? The top line is our gross national product. But the bottom line, which is happiness, starting from back in the 40s, notice that today we're slightly less happy than we were during the Great Depression. And it's not as though, well, it's the recession. No, it's not. It's something else. But on a high note, does everybody see there was a blip of happiness? It happened in the 60s. Now, we don't know why. We all can have our theories. But I want to share with you what the 60s looked like. Today, this same location, Bryant Park in New York City, by just making a few little transformations, now looks like this. We took down the edges to the park to a proper size where people could look in, look out of the park, where only good behaviors could occur in the park. We added over 3,000 portable chairs to the mix and truly uh, brought back the life to one park by making a few little modifications. And that's truly what we, as a nation, are capable of, but at one park at a time, one neighborhood at a time, one street at a time. Now let's talk about the economics of streets. The upper street, you can probably tell, makes a fortune. It's the oldest walk on planet Earth. It is the Ramblas in Barcelona. And it's always packed with people. When I'm in Barcelona, I will go and walk there five or six different times during the day and each time have a totally new and unique experience. The lower road, which is in Spartanburg, is way overbuilt for the car, way underbuilt for people. And as a result, it really has destroyed the value of adjacent lands. So think about that. When we build a street, that's lovely, that we're attracted to, that uh, really sets a place, we're adding value to our properties. We are in a mega, mega shift of uh, many things all at once, not only talking about health and livability and aging in place and uh, economics, but we are truly in a pivotal moment in how much it's gonna to cost to transport ourselves if we stick with the same systems. And as long as it's single occupant vehicle travel, we can predict the costs are gonna go up. If no other reason, China and India are ready to buy the oil that we want to buy. And as we see this, if we don't have the alternatives, then our economy is not gonna do well. So let's talk about how we might build our streets for more uses. Does everybody see the one remaining person in Missoula, Montana? I went back three days later and she was still there. <laughs> now, the, the road uh, that we see, the Marine Drive in Dunderave in Canada, by functional classification is the same. They're identical. The lower road makes a lot more money. People's measured blood pressure goes down, not up. The road is more aesthetic. We have more money to pay for the maintenance because it makes more money. It is a much safer road. And here's the real catch. It moves more traffic. So why build roads? They're going to be less safe, not move traffic as well, be more congested, and destroy land value and raise people's blood pressure. We've got to stop doing the things the pirates never would have done. That Thomas Jefferson or George Washington would have considered insane. We need to build our America on place. And so it's a choice. We can say, well, wait a minute, this is, uh, this is Virginia. This is where everyone could do anything they darn well please with their land. Yeah, we could be that, but we could also be the state or the community in a state that says there is a better way and we will find that better way and we will build something that makes money and does all the work we want it to do and set a new stage. So let's just take anybody's town. This happens to be 
West Lafayette, Indiana, home of Purdue. Anyone here graduate from Purdue? Anyone here ever hear of Purdue? <laughs> okay, joke, okay. What do they have too much of? Yeah, and what do they have not enough of? Yeah, so you basically take the things there's too much of and take it away and replace it with the things you need. You need the parking, you need the trees, you need the green, you need the shade, you need people. <laughs> and all we did is cut out somebody else's town. This is West Lafayette as it is. And I cut out uh, uh, Santa Cruz, California, and laid it out on top. And that's all I did. The same buildings are there. But we took out the unnecessary travel lanes as we did this. This town, when we did the charrette in 1994, uh, was so empty of human life, two of our cars were broken into while we did the charrette, the workshop. And uh, very important to point out that once we had the vision together and brought the development in, that area now looks like this. One developer alone brought in $1.3 billion, and that was just the start. There are many things that have resulted by bringing together a vision, reclaiming land, and revitalizing the land for people. The road on the right, which is going to disappear in a second, was replaced by the road on the left. Now, it was a friend of mine who bought the, the entire block. She paid $150,000 for a down payment. That's all it was. She got a hotel and 20 storefronts. But she knew what she was doing. She partnered with the person owning the building across the street. They formed a business association. They collaborated. They asked the city to fix the street. And within a year, she was worth $15 million. So she bought the next block. And the street was fixed. And now she's worth $30 million. Whoops. I think I know what I'm doing wrong here. Hold one second. So she bought the next block. And you see where I'm going? Linda retired with $45 million in her pocket because she knew how to be a pioneer, an innovator, and to do the things that the human heart and common sense said to do. She was not an urban designer. When we look at a road like this, and it's just an intersection, it looks fairly benign. The engineers have done everything they can to make this work and perform, and it's working. But it's not that safe. But if only the engineers get their chance to make it work, it's going to fail. So once we bring in the architects and landscape architects and planners and, and other people, then we can transform that intersection into this. And now it will make immense money. It will be safer. It will uh, truly uh, be a generator of new income. But we've got to have all these disciplines working as one. The importance of having that collaboration. I cannot really talk about light rail without talking about it being one of the best gifts to bringing back the life to a city if you do it right. And in this case, notice to span this river, which by the way, there was frozen ice on the edges. It was 20 degrees that day. And uh, I counted over 300 bicycles going across this bridge in less than 30 minutes. They use the same structure, not only for the light rail, but to get people walking and bicycling into and out of the downtown. We need that complete system. In uh, Vancouver, Washington, more specifically, uh, one of the suburban areas, Richmond, they put in what's called the Sky Train. This was built a number of years ago, but it paid off handsomely during the Winter Olympics moving 280,000 people every day. 280,000 people with a system that uh, was very, very affordable and is now performing as a place to generate activity around. So everywhere they're building the light rail and or in this case the sky train, they are now seeing beautiful neighborhoods come together. That's the point. Don't build massive parking lots for park and ride lots build community, that's what makes all the money. Parking lots make no money. They just take and take and take. But the concepts that you're applying here are going to pay off quite handsomely. 
and end up being beautiful places and places of the heart. It's also important, though, to point out that most of the images I'm showing you tonight, I could not have photographed 15 years ago. That's how fast we are rebuilding our nation. And again, we're doing it one neighborhood at a time, but the point is we can take any category of road, in this case a neighborhood collector on the top, and notice everybody builds their mansions, their homes to a good street, but on the below street, which is the same category of road, a neighborhood connector, uh, collector, and uh, the smart developer would never orient a building to that street. It just wouldn't sell. So we have to get our street designs correct if we're to get the buildings watching over the street and therefore people walking or bicycling. It's, it's a very simple rule, but it's one that, that is hard to come by because no one has sat down and written the rule. Um, it's something we have to, to, to get. I'm going to skip this. It ended up in a second time. Now let's talk about another way to make money for a town. Tree canopies. People love trees. And they will spend, on average, 12 cents more on the dollar in a store that's under a canopy. You might, from time to time, hear a retailer saying, well, cut down all the trees. I want people to see my signs. That retailer won't make it because the whole Main Street won't make it if, if it looks too stark. The trees are what bring back the people. We have very complex con ideas and notions that we're going to have to address in our country. Everything has changed, including play. Uh, children spend their time doing other things today, but they need activity. And if they don't have activity, one, they don't develop the neural pathways that those who uh, at earlier years could walk, could bike, could discover, could have adventures. They uh, don't perform as well on tests in the school. They now know that if children just walk to school, they're going to get higher test scores on average than children who are driven back and forth to schools. But think about where we've put our schools and the fact that, like today, only 1 in 12 children is able to walk or to bicycle to school. So let's consider our children, our canaries in the coal mine, that when we see problems with our children, that they're becoming obese, that they're taking more and more medications for uh, uh, depression, for all kinds of things, then we realize we're failing our children and it's time to wake up. Today, the average child only has a range one-ninth of what I had as a child growing up. We built these environments. We can correct them. It's important to point out that children need free range. We do it for our chickens. <laughs> Let's do it for our children. Now, during this journey, um, there have been some sad moments. This is one of the saddest I can share with you. I was in this town. It's, it's not going to be mentioned. You won't know the name of the town. But there was no town center in this town. And so when we got to this big regional park, I asked the person standing next to me, wanting to say something positive, uh, when will you complete your public restroom? And he turned to me and said, well, Dan, it's finished. I said, no, it's not. Those are outhouses. When will you build the public restroom facility? And he turned to me and understood what I was saying. He said, well, it is finished. If we did anything more, our children would destroy it. Think about that. This town sits almost next to the high school Columbine. Children raised in the ends of cul-de-sacs have a lot of problems in life. And when we think about how we have abandoned our children in basic things like where they get to live, we begin to realize that we have helped create these problems. There are so many repercussions of how we design a community that if we only got back to the way they've been built for tens of thousands of years, we would get it right. A little bit later, I was able to go to the other uh, Littleton, uh, New Hampshire, and it's a small town, 7,000 population. They've been losing jobs forever. It's just, it's just a hard place to maintain life. But they hold on to the life and the integrity of their town. Uh, they have lots of churches. 
uh, when you see their Main Street, it's absolutely classic, and they do everything for their children. They have bookstores for their children. They have an oversized library. They have movie houses. Anything they can do for their children, they do. So people want to live there, and they struggle, and they hold on, and they keep some kind of a job or employment, and so, so uh, Littleton continues to do well. It's all on how we design for our people. But these are the things that worry us, that uh, we're seeing more and more medications being prescribed for our children uh, because of the lives that we're able to give them, uh, more suicides, uh, more absolute um, um, prescriptions uh, for, for drugs. We're also becoming and already are the fattest nation in the history of the earth. And we're getting fatter. Because of our built environment, and other factors like our nutrition. We're eating the wrong things, and we're eating too many of the wrong things. Uh, it's important, though, to realize there are many other things we're losing. I'll just mention one. In this case, uh, Cheryl, when we were doing an interview on a different topic, paused for a moment, had this aha moment where she realized when she went to buy a house, she forgot to buy a neighborhood. She cannot find volunteers in her neighborhood. A real neighborhood gives you volunteers. It's a natural thing to do. And I'm very worried, especially now that I'm 66, and thinking a lot about aging, uh, how many of our Americans are going to age in place, age beautifully and gracefully with dignity, and not be shut in because they bought a house that seemed right at the time, but really doesn't give them access to the things they need. At some point, they'll cut back on their driving. At some point, they won't drive. And we have to think about what's missing. Every time we take a walk, drive our car, we should look for those things uh, that are out of sync with our values. This is one of the wealthiest counties in North America. It's in Virginia. What did we forget to provide here? The public is telling us how to design our streetscape. Am I correct about that? And all we have to do is open our eyes. Or in this town, they're building all the ramps in totally the wrong place, and they continue to do it when the public is saying, no, I want to cross here. This is safer. It's better. It's more direct. We fail to put in ramps altogether. We build streets so wide our children cannot get to school any other way than being boxed into a yellow box and driven there or by mom or dad. And it doesn't matter what town I go to, these scenes are so easy to photograph. In a 10-minute period, I can capture most of these scenes in, in your community. So we want to change. How do we do it? First and foremost, stop measuring the things we don't want and measure the things we do want. Now that doesn't mean you give up on measuring cars and capacity and levels of service. It just means that's no longer the only thing you measure. But now, um, measure the things you want. If all you want is traffic, great. You've already got the tools to measure that. But what if you now want more social engagement, more volunteerism, uh, more uh, folks watching over our children, greener places, more interactive places, then we measure those things. And we give ourselves a, a new scorecard. And one of the things I would measure is how many weddings take place by bicycle. In Vancouver, on one weekend, I photographed three different weddings all taking place by bicycle. To me, that's a positive score. Or in San Francisco, where there used to be a freeway, we measure how many weddings are taking place uh, on this new road that is built beautifully, by the way, right along the waterfront where people come to have their wedding pictures taken. Uh, the entire wedding party uh, and uh, bride and groom, they weren't just waiting for a bus. They were really here because they were so proud of this street and uh, how their city was remade. I would also measure the number of green grocers that you find in a given block. That's a positive indicator, access to good food, that you've got enough density, enough things going on that um, the streets are working and the stores are making good money. But I also measure things like whether I get to see children playing games on their own. 
not waiting for somebody to tell them to get off the bench, but that they do some pickup ball right in front of their own homes. Now at the far end of this park are market-driven homes. We'll rotate to the right, and the homes here are attached, they are affordable, the people who live in them own the houses. And they're very proud to live in an, a home where there's normal market-driven homes that they could get in, that their children can be raised with other children who maybe have more privileges, but they play together. And prejudice begin to melt. And that's what we need to build a healthy economic life for everybody. But we have to think about aging in place. Uh, again, these are so easy for me to go out and capture. Um, it's just unfortunate that we only built streets for one purpose. That indeed we, we put all of our money into that capacity issue. We forgot about the fact that people might want to use transit. That they may not own a car. By the way, a third of Floridians don't own a car. And that's true in most states. And, uh, and think about that. That, by the way, doesn't even include our children. Children don't own cars. We need a place where as we get older we can age gracefully with dignity, carry on conversations, walk with our grandchildren, walk with our favorite other. Uh, so I'm going to take you to a town where they're doing this. This is um, Vernon. It's in British Columbia. And as far and as wide as I walked I could not photograph a senior that did not have a smile on their face. What did their town do that was so unique? Well, first of all, they focused their energies on building their town for people. They still had accommodation for the car. That wasn't going to go away. But, for example, they built a beautiful residential stock right in close to their downtown so that all seniors could come downtown, socialize, spend time, go to the stores, get their groceries, do all the things, and, and not own a car, which they don't need. They just need a good place to live and a good place to socialize and to be part of the community. And when we do this, we're opening up all kinds of doors to people of all abilities. And uh, now, to get that, we need to understand where things started to go wrong. And it was a long time ago, when we first built trolleys, they were what built our neighbors. They gave us the right size, the right scale, the right orientation, everything was correct when we were building the trolleys. That's what we're going to get back. Now, it's interesting to know that the demise of the trolleys uh, didn't happen after World War II. It actually happened in the early 1920s when uh, cars were coming into vogue and the most elite people in the communities, uh, in this case, uh, some, some very well-recorded stories of some movie actresses that wanted to go to the awards and didn't want to arrive by a trolley. So she fought the design of the trolley system and she wanted on-street parking so that she could pull straight up in front of the stores in her car with that freedom and with that and so on. So we have to think about where did things start to erode and go wrong and what really was lost and uh, how do we now get it back. Also the Federal Housing Administration in the 1930s told us to stop building connected streets. Build cul-de-sacs. This was from the Federal Housing Administration. Before engineers figured these things out, we were already being told to disconnect our neighborhoods by the Federal Housing Administration. So somewhere around 1930, we could find in popular magazines, Post Magazine, that if we're to have full use of automobiles, we had to remake our cities for the car. 1930s. Again, well before the end of World War II. Uh, as recently as 1972, we had traffic engineers tell us well, they could move the traffic if we could just get rid of those darn people. There is no silver bullet. You get rid of people, you're just going to have more cars. But today, the modern traffic engineer has figured out, build villages, the traffic will be taken care of. And true, it's true. The more villages you build, the shorter distances people have to go by car, by foot, by bike, by transit, 
to get to a shopping district, the less traffic you have. It's just such a simple formula. It's nothing but common sense. And we're figuring that one out. Uh, but here's the scary thing. As recently as this last June, we were told that all we have to do to have a drivable future is to design the future city that is car friendly. Folks, we've tried that. We tried it redundantly. The cities we spent the most money on in the car are the ones that are struggling the most. The Detroits, virtually all cities tied to the auto industry in Michigan are really hurting. Atlanta, Houston, Las Vegas, these are gonna to be tough cities to rescue. We'll do it, but they're gonna to be tough. Now we were warned by no one less than Jane Jacobs, who was another observer of cities, who basically pointed out that it's so much easier to meet the needs of the automobile than it is to understand the complexities of city making and to get that right. So once we got distracted, we lost our traction. Now we're gaining it, and we will rebuild our cities correctly. And here's why. First of all, anything other than building for people will never pencil out. Notice our green line on the left is the growth of population in the United States, and the red line is the growth of our vehicle miles traveled daily. So our dependency on driving has gone up at an astronomical rate. That's what is not sustainable. We can't build enough roads. We cannot correct enough systems to support people having the mobility. Therefore, things will have a meltdown over time. In fact, that's what we're experiencing. But here's the big concern, that as we increase the, the amount of money each person spends on their transportation, it's already approaching or at 25 cents for the dollar you take home after all the taxes, 25 cents is what you're spending on your personal transportation. Go home and figure it out and it's likely to be right there at that 25 cents. This is not sustainable for a family. It's certainly not sustainable for a city or a county or a state. It just doesn't pencil out. Now here's the other frightening prospect as we uh, develop more fuel efficient vehicles, as we drive shorter distances for many reasons, as we go to like, uh, very likely more electric vehicles, we're not gonna be bringing in the gas taxes that we once did. And indeed, the cost of building highways is going up. It's going way up. And, and so where over 20 years, we were able to add 2% to the lane capacity, while our demand went up 70%, 35 times faster. And now we're not going to have as much money. This truly, folks, is a dead-end street. We won't be able to sustain that. Now, here's the, the idea. We can keep doing what we're doing and grow our traffic another 25% in the next 10 years, or take the alternative and now build villages. Now the villages will make money. The, the villages will give us a return on our investments, and that is very significant. Roads don't do that, they can't do that. Typically roads devalue land. Now we thought all this would work because it, we got this wonderful sugar rush as we widened an intersection, widened a road, uh, we basically reduced delay and reduced the cost of travel. We did, but <laughs> uh, we didn't think about the dynamics of the system. People move further away, they range further, they, they drove further to get to their stores. The third order changes vastly increased our demand of vehicle miles traveled per household per day, the time, the lost time that we could be volunteering or, or doing something else we'd rather do. So I wanna close this opening section with the notion that we have the leadership in America. We can develop and evolve the right ideas, the right tools, the right civic engagement to now gain our traction and build the things that we need. And with that, I'm going to now go to uh, a second part, and that is what will the next America look like? And you've already pretty nicely laid it out in the work that you've been doing uh, with your transit villages, the concepts, the notions, the ones you've actually built. 
Basically, now we go back to James Perry and we'll see the other half of the story. When you look at the actual bones of uh, Seaside, this is exactly James Perry's idea from 1928. Built in the 1990s, perhaps the most profitable and loved place in modern urban design. And it's such a simple notion. Point the streets toward the water, have a nice little circulation, make it very easy to walk, everything is connected. People pay immense prices for homes, for lots, and everything is very walkable, very bikeable, very transit friendly, very everything. But this is a more dense package, but boy, do you ever get a lot of open space. I think it's important to point out that we'll build uh, these things just simply because they really do work, they do perform. Take you to one of my favorite streets in North America. This is State Street. It's in Santa Barbara. It runs all the way from the sea way up into the foothills. It used to be four lanes. We took out half of the lanes. Uh, now we're narrowing down the lanes. They're down to 10 feet already, and we're likely to take them down to 9 feet as we add wider uh, uh, edges uh, to the street and now people will drive uh, fairly good distances to get to Santa Barbara in order to enjoy the life in Santa Barbara and it's amazing how just refabricating the street allows all of this economic life just to come and fill in all these voids and spaces and really become a wonderful place. A couple basic things uh, when we see something we like that we fall in love with it makes money. <laughs> we see things we don't like, we're a little bit embarrassed about. It fails to make the kind of money that we need. Now, it did at one time, and it did a little while, but it doesn't sustain itself. And now that more people are figuring out how to build that, which is beautiful and attractive and functional, the more the things that aren't that are going to fail. Now, if it does make all the sense in the world, just looking at the pattern, the structure, then all we have to do is go down to the street level, and we realize why we would spend an hour in one of these places and not an hour in the other place. Does that all make sense, folks? It's, I mean, it really is common sense once you see it. So then we ask ourselves, well, what are the things that we would be in love with if we would just build it? How about if our trails had outlooks and swings and parks? Uh, were uh, full of sun and shade so we could move about? What if all of our communities were based around a five minute walk by radius and put most of the concentration of our development in that five minute walk and then another area out 10 minute walk, now we're gonna make really good money on that intense area. Now here's the cool thing. Those who live further out, although they have a longer distance to walk, and they may choose not to walk, they're still single-family homes. So we're not tearing down people's homes. We're just basically filling in some voids and starting to really make a lot of uh, convenience for all the people who already live in those places. To do it, we need good street connections. We could uh, have something connected this much, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Or we can have this much. And truly, what we do now is we measure the perimeter of a block. And if the perimeter falls somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 linear feet, then it's a good block. And we give that permission to a developer to bring us things that will work with the topography and the other issues they face. And now we can get good block form, and now we have walkability. And then, of course, we put in the neighborhood centers, the civic buildings, the parks, open spaces. And now people don't really need to get into a car to go somewhere else. Uh, to get education, to get uh, a good walk, or a good uh, uh, library book, or, or uh, buy some oatmeal, uh, or whatever people are going to buy. It also means that we go away from buildings that misbehave, this one does, it moons the street. Does everybody see that? The same hotel chain, when your code calls for it, will give this to you. This is a gift. This is not. This will destroy land anywhere nearby. This builds the value of the land and uh, really creates the desire to walk. So our organization, Walkable Livable Communities Institute, is in the process of creating 30 different posters. This is the first one. 
to show people how important, where you put the building is, how it addresses the street, how many windows it has, uh, that that matters. If people are to walk, it's not about sidewalks and crossings. It's about everything else. You still want the sidewalks and the crossings, but you must have buildings that behave. Does everybody see that? It's To me, it's just apparent, but I don't want to make a huge leap. Okay. Uh, now, the buildings don't have to be big. In some neighborhoods, you don't want anything bigger than this, but you probably want a couple dozen of them. And, uh, and we now know how to make buildings like that work, how to behave, how to perform, how to make money. In Seattle, they're a little ahead of everybody else, it seems. Uh, they are now building mixed use. Notice that uh, this is a Starbucks coffee house and on top, residential living. Indeed, in Seattle today, you cannot build commercial without having residential with it. You cannot build residential without having commercial with it. That's the rule. And Seattle's doing pretty darn good uh, in terms of economics. By the way, they had bulldozed a, a McDonald's that had been here. And they did it in the middle of the night because McDonald's didn't want to know that people in Seattle are changing their, their eating habits. Uh, and they are. They now want coffee. They don't want deep, fit, deep fat bits. People want access to food. So we need smaller footprints for grocers. And for the grocers to make good money with a smaller footprint. And these are all harder things to do than one big superstore coming in and figuring out how to make money. In this neighborhood, in Victoria, the folks uh, designed their own store and then uh, lease it out to a large enough grocer that they can have all the food that they want in their neighborhood. Now when we do these things, we totally honor each neighborhood. So one can conjecture here, this is a former industrial era area that uh, there's a certain character, quality to the buildings. So when the architects come in and conceptualize what the buildings will be, their massing, their orientation, everything, they're honoring the history of the neighborhood. Here's the cool thing. When you go back a few years later and see these things being built, they really take on beauty and, and real substance, real shape. Uh, people love living here. The developers make good money and people now have great access to downtown Petaluma and, and truly are bringing alive an area that uh, was just waiting for good investment to occur. This is good at infill and, uh, and, and really truly is, is performing. Now when we get all the details right, we're gonna do even more. So as an example, uh, when a person today uh, passes through here, they have to be tangled up by three different intersections. And if you come in here at the wrong time of the day, you could be sitting for 20 minutes. So what if we now put development where it's going to really pay huge dividends and require, this is not an option, we require the developer to put a couple street connections in. And by doing this, we totally bypass those troubled intersections and during the regular time of the day, people might go around, but then during the real peak, they're going to come right into the town center, which is actually what the developer wants. And they may pick up, drop off dry cleaning, they, they may run errands, they may stay for entertainment. Uh, some of the solution for your mega problematic intersection out here is what you did. Now, whether or not it's performing as well as you want, that may take some time, but the point is you did the right thing by building the town center uh, in one of your most troubled intersection areas. Um, but it's a partnership between land use and uh, transfer, transportation. This is a smaller town, Chico, California. You can see the road structure. The area in the absolute center of the big road is what we call a confluence. It has to carry the load of the traffic coming from the north going to the south. It also has to carry all the traffic from the east and the west and it has to do it through two very troubled intersections. The solution for this, if we only had engineers, would be to uh, build a $70 million overpass, which would totally destroy the land value, or to go from a two-lane road to a five-lane road, and just to buy the land would be $300 million, and that'll never happen. So by bringing the disciplines together, transportation and land use, we end up building more streets, and now build the village with the stores, use roundabouts, and we go from six hours 
of Lovell Service App, that's a parking lot, to maybe 20 minutes. And we've added huge value to that land. So everybody gets wherever they want to go any time of the day in far less time. And now they may only go this far because most of the stores you want are right here. That's combining land use with transportation. And your notion or concept for your uh, transit villages is this. You're going to solve a huge number of your, your transportation problems by building your villages correctly with good interconnected street systems. What if you didn't do that? What if you just kept doing what uh, has been done for a couple of decades? This is a town that uh, I don't know where to bail this town out. I just don't. It's Atlanta. More specifically, it's Roswell. It's got 3,500 miles of streets. But how many of them connect? It's actually 21%. The number is flipped around. But does everybody see why people in Roswell will spend two hours every day in their car? There just is no way to build enough system to support so few roads trying to do all of the heavy lifting. We can do the same thing. The University City area, you can see uh, if we were only to stitch the freeways together, we get some temporary relief, but we put more and more people in the cars over time. But if instead we build this, we not only get the relief, but we give the destinations for people to come to. We increase the land value uh, by many factors. And now we move our traffic better because there's less of it, and uh, we have a road system that will support that concept. So again, this is, this is really where you're heading, and it's really uh, the right way to go. It uh, sounds so simple, because it is. <laughs> it's not complicated. Uh, we took this town where the engineers had taken out the waterfront, the Olmstead Parks, back when we were doing that kind of thing, and now you see uh, where all those highways are, and this is the future of these highways. This is a project that Walter Kulash has been working on, and, uh, and it really is uh, a, a totally different way of thinking of communities other than creating traffic, create village. Michael Friedman gives us the tools to understand these things. He basically says, historically, this is what we did. We created the strip corridors. We emptied our downtown so their life of their vitality. Uh, people cannot congregate in a strip. You just don't. Uh, so that was taken. It uh, went with the Euclidean zoning, obviously, something that everybody knows how to do and did. And uh, what Michael says is the future is to take these same roads and turn them into true nodes. And again, some villages will be significant size, some will be pretty small, but they'll still be a village. And you can kind of see them uh, uh, as we colorize a couple of locations. And uh, then we can go and actually take a look at how the zoning will change from everything being all red in this case, or all red and yellow, to truly a mix of uses where people can live and shop and, and uh, drive much shorter distances. We've built hundreds of these now. And in every case, we're learning new things, but we're finding out that the concepts work. One reason they work is we're increasing the value of the land. Absolutely phenomenal how much more land it's worth is if you go to mixed use than if you stick with a strip concept. We'll go to one that's in transition, and uh, or was when I photographed, the Highgate Village, which is in uh, Burnaby in British Columbia. In Vancouver now, they're building eco-villages. They finished all of Vancouver. It's done. Now they need their growth to go into their suburban areas. And here's how they're doing it. So we go to the Highgate Village. It looks like this. They're building the buildings out to the street first. Those get completed. We'll step behind that building and see what they're doing. They're keeping the stores open. And now you can see where the parking is, the tree wells, where the sidewalks will be. We go back three years later and now realize that they built beautiful streets, green streets, nice sidewalks, good parking, and uh, beautiful buildings. The buildings are basically built as you did with the uh, building with the Weston Hotel, uh, podium buildings, low buildings. 
and then towers that go up from there. But now the streets are attractive. They're low speed. People don't speed up and down these streets. It's not a big, massive parking lot anymore. Uh, out on the larger streets, you can still have your power centers, but they're built different than if they were all parking lot out in front. Now, to do these things, we can go to any size, any scale community. So I'm going to take you to a small town, Hudson, Ohio, probably small enough you've never heard of, sits halfway between Cleveland and Akron, an old historic town. And they realized they wanted to capture a lot of the marketplace, uh, take it ba basically from Cleveland and Akron. But they, to do it, they said, well, we're going to have to have something that is authentic, something that is us. And they did. Uh, the store on the left is a grocer. They also have green grocers. They have other uh, beautiful things. They built a fantastic library, a nature uh, historic museum for the children. And now, truly, people come from Cleveland. They come from Akron. They spend time and money in this little village and enjoy the historic qualities. But we can also do it in a very big city. This is Vancouver, British Columbia the densest city in North America. This is denser than the Queens, than the Bronx, than South Beach, than Honolulu. This is the densest. And it wasn't always this way. You can see the single family residential stock is still there. Where they put the density is on their waterfront. The old industrial yards, the old rail yards, all the things that got abused is now where the density is. And uh, you can see again the concept, at least, how they did it. Uh, they basically build the low platform buildings next to the water. The developer is required to dedicate the first 50 feet of land for trails and to build them and to maintain them, clear around the entire peninsula. They also require 80 feet between the buildings so that any future large buildings built further back will still have a total view of the water. This is Brilliant. This is common sense. It's taking the concepts or the notions that George Washington knew to do without having gone through a design school. Um, now, how does it work for traffic? The densest city in North America. They have no freeways in the peninsula. And um, in this case, the gentleman in the turquoise jacket, Gordon Price, is explaining to our group, a group that I brought up there, that... Um, all these buildings standing, standing around us, oh dear, what did I do? Okay, there's got to be a way to get back in. Is there a mouse? Enter? Escape? Enter? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for rescuing me. <laughs> Collaboration, that's what it takes. So the gentleman in the turquoise jacket, Gordon Price, is explaining uh, how this works. And about 10 minutes into his discussion, he says, where are the cars? These are all 12-story buildings. We're in the heart of Vancouver. Where are the cars? And that's his point. Is It's more convenient to walk. It's more convenient to bicycle than to go and get your car and drive it to another place where you're going to drive around looking for a parking space. So everybody walks, everybody bicycles. It's the natural thing to do. Their transit ridership has gone way up. The health of their communities is going up. The cost for medical care is going down. The crime is going down. Everything you want to go down is going down. Everything you want to go up is going up. That's what density is. When you build, lay out your city correctly, you get all the things you want, and you don't end up with a lot of traffic. By the way, after 10 minutes, we did see one car come by. And I said to the group, you know, you're out on your own today. Uh, bike, bike anywhere you want, and, but promise me that you'll stop every 10 or 20 minutes and take a look around you. There will never be a time we're not in sight of people. Many people walking, many people bicycling, and it, they came back that evening and said, Dan, you were right. I said, sure, I'm right. Um, but they didn't see that many cars. Until they got down some bigger roads, which was also designed to handle the bikes, um, they were in heaven the whole time. The planner, um, Brent Totteron, uh, took his birthday to show us around. 
and essentially explain how everything works, how they were able to get the collaboration, and how all the developers are making far more money than if they'd all gone out on their own and done something that didn't make sense. By working together, everybody uh, pencils out uh, better profits, better uh, solutions. And, and I think you can see it. The first 50 feet, again, belong to the public. The buildings get properly set back. They're staged. And, uh, and meanwhile, there are these incredible tower buildings that keep getting built and add to the beauty and uh, the charm and the dignity of this city. And it, and it really is a marvel to see this coming together. They didn't start this, by the way, until 20 years ago. This is all brand new. Um, and again, when you ride a bike and you just want to ride a bike, you want to ride around the perimeter, you want to ride all around all of Stanley Park, clear out into Dunderave and other places, and it works, and it works because it was really designed for people, people first. So with all this said, we're not going to leave the car behind. The car is our culture, but we're going to add to it. And we're going to, in the future, complete our streets, and they truly are going to be for everyone. Uh, every age, every ability, every income level, and everyone will now have access to our cities, and this is going to be a profound difference in uh, how we care for our cities, how much more we're going to want to volunteer and to do things, because we're truly looking out for all of our citizens and uh, a brand new set of demographics that will come. But here's the cool thing, and I'll just quickly go through these images. Uh, in a nutshell, we have to give ourselves permission to build our streets differently than we have in the past. They were for only one use in the past, and we loaded them up with that one use. But now that we give ourselves permission to go with different designs, they're going to be for everybody. We'll start with the big, bigger roads, the boulevards, um, in this case, uh, you can see the upper picture and the lower picture, the same road. I'm actually taking both these pictures from the same intersection, just turned around in the bucket truck. And this is Route 66. It's the same funding source, the same uh, drivers, and the same Bibles allow us to build the road both ways. Now, when we take an actual road, in this case, uh, Bridgeport Way in University Place, Washington, before we made any transitions, you wouldn't want to walk here, you wouldn't want to bike here, you wouldn't want to use transit here. What are you going to do when you get off the bus? That road, one year later, became this road. We can see it uh, again from the air looking the other direction. And now we look at it nine years later, and it looks like this. At grade, it looks like this. We have added so much value to the adjacent lands that Trader Joe's has moved their store right here. One of their best producing stores in all the Pacific Northwest is now sitting here on a street they never would have come to. And that's just an example. The businesses, even though we took out their ability to have motors turn left in or out, they're making 30% more money. But the town is going to the next step. They're going to take out that street and rebuild it, here you see it being rebuilt, and it's going to have back in angled parking. It's going to have a raised intersection on a regional trunk road. They're going to have underground parking, buildings above, uh, the new library, the new city hall. We're really talking about the road has to set the stage for the success of the new village. If the roads aren't right, you really can't get your village to perform the way you need to. It's a partnership. Baldwin Park, a former naval uh, training station in Orlando. Uh, beautiful what they've done to uh, now create new streets. Pensacola, Florida, another naval town, and uh, how they're going to transform this street, which was only for speed before, and now it's completed. It's for people. La Jolla Boulevard, a five-lane road in uh, San Diego, transformed from this down to two lanes. Went from speeds of 50 miles an hour down to 20 to 22. We took out all the signals and uh, replaced them with roundabouts and we're getting people home sooner at 20 to 22 miles an hour. 
Pottstown, Pennsylvania, back in angled parking. We can add a lot more. Uh, by the way, they took out two travel lanes as we did this. We're learning now how to use many new tools. These are what we call green share lanes. This road has 38,000 cars. That's a lot of traffic. But when a motor sees the bicyclist in the green lane, they are not to pass in that lane. They have to go out in the other lane. And it's working, and it's working beautifully. Many people are now bicycling. Or this town, which may win the top prize this year for the best new made street in America by the people's choice. We took out five traffic signals, replaced them all with roundabouts, and uh, narrowed the lanes down to nine feet. This is a major state trunk road, carries a lot of truck traffic, and we were able to make all these changes. When we take a road and narrow it down, neck it down, we make it easy to cross the street. We can add a lot more parking. When we walked today uh, in the town center, we found some great opportunities, like on your one-way streets, to make these conversions. Uh, curb extensions, it's profound how much more they add back to the community, uh, and you have these opportunities in many, many places. But now for the big tools. The roundabout, not well understood yet in our country, and yet we Americans developed the roundabout. It's our creation. Europe put it to work, but we developed it. Eno himself came up with the concept. Now why? Well, first and foremost, they're safer by many factors. Nine times safer. For personal injury crashes, you can see a 90% reduction in crashes. It all makes sense. The traffic doesn't back up. It doesn't need to. It keeps flowing. So this is the site of the first roundabout in Florida. This is where it's located. You can see by the air. Now we go back down to grade. You can see what it used to be, and it would take one human life every year. That's a lot. So I came in, I proposed the roundabout, and we put it in place. It's been in place now for 15 years. The traffic never backs up. It keeps flowing, and uh, we have yet to record a crash. In 15 years, we have yet to record a crash, and it's moving 18,000 vehicles a day. It added value to the land, and we built new buildings. Get back to La Jolla, you can see the before with five lanes and the after. The before and the after. The first two roundabouts were built by a developer who was given more entitlement if he would pay for the roundabouts. That was a good deal for the developer. It was a great deal for the community. The next three roundabouts were built by the Air District, who wanted cleaner air. The gentleman who was able to get this through, you see standing in the dark jacket, uh, Scott Peters, uh, was the president of the city council. He, he, one might say, staked his political career on, on whether this would work or not. Uh, I worked with Scott on this. We got it built, and uh, he now became pretty famous in the San Diego. People from all over the country are now going to study uh, these uh, alterations, removing five signals and putting in five roundabouts, and moving the traffic better. People get home sooner at a much lower speed. We're seeing new stores come in. Indeed, a lot of new stores. Uh, all of the stores uh, typically are making 30% more money. And uh, uh, as we build place, as we make it easier to walk, easier to bike, create more civility, more social engagement, we see more people uh, coming to spend time in these areas. Hamburg, seen from the air, you see a roundabout. Notice the pedestrian entering the street. Look at the third car back. Driver already realizes she's going to be crossing the path in a second. He holds back, and uh, you can see she's actually stepping out of the street and hasn't held back one car. Now, before, you had to have an exclusive phase for the pedestrian, or at least a full phase to get that person into the street. Now, now you don't even need that. So we're learning. We're learning by building many new tools. Uh, you probably don't need this list, but it's something I recommend to all communities. Pick some pilot projects. Get the ones that you know are going to be fairly direct and easy to build. Get those on the ground first. Model them. Uh, when we were walking, we were talking about 
transforming your nightmarish roads uh, with some roundabouts, but don't start on those roads, start on some others. Work your way up and definitely make sure you get the right procedures in place, that you've got the right backing and go forward. You're going to need uh, to fund a number of really unique projects, uh, but, but truly pick those models that you want to make sure they work and how you're going to build them. And once you do this, you're going to need some new Bibles. You're going to need to make sure that your engineers can build the roads that you want because your city council approves a new manual and uh, with that then be able to provide uh, for a much more economically successful town and so that every project you build is going to be able to be maintained, is going to be able to uh, bring in the people, ring the cash registers. Now at first you may just want to adopt somebody else's manual. Uh, this is one that, that I got to work on put out by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. One of the other really good ones that you might want to look at very seriously is Charlotte, North Carolina. And, uh, but otherwise, to come up with the guidance, uh, how you're going to change out various things, with the end goal of having the most healthy, the most active community, and then figure out how to get there. What steps do you need in order to get there? I'm going to close with a couple of very simple uh, concepts, and that is take whatever your assets are. It's the beach. It's whatever other open water that you have. They did that in Golden. They basically took $750,000, moved some rocks around in Clear Creek, and as a result, they attract families from all over. Each year, they make an extra 2 or $3 million dollars by having moved some boulders around in the creek and make it into a recreational resource. There are trails up and down. Uh, but today there are many new restaurants, many new hotels, uh, gas stations are pumping more gas, all of the things that you want for a thriving, well-rounded economy because they took that asset, that waiting opportunity, and turned it around. And you have so many of these opportunities to take. Uh, skip that, but... I want to close out by not making this seem too simple. Keep in mind the American public, including the American driver. Oh, don't do that. I, I see what I did, but it's, it's uh, let's see, go back to this one and that one. And how do I do that? Okay. <laughs> the American public as recently as uh, weeks before the... Uh, gas prices started to soar, listed fuel efficiency as 17th on their list of things to look for when buying a car. That's fickle. And we have to remember that, that you're going to need to help educate. And hopefully uh, this presentation, you know, will open a few eyes and ears and, and so on. But you need to have the public with you. That doesn't mean everybody gets it. But it means people other than your elected leaders, other than your planning commissioners, other than your staff, know the language. They know why these are important ideas, and they're willing to talk to their neighbors, the people that go to their churches, or um, ride bikes with them, or whatever, so that in time, you're given more and more permission to do more of the things that are really, truly going to pencil out and make good money for you, and build a town where everyone can age in place, where you want to raise your children, and where things work. And being in Virginia, uh, so important to understand that Tom Jefferson totally got this, that if we're to have a democracy, we have to have informed citizens. There is no other way to really get the permission to build differently than we've built in the past. If we want an economy that thrives, then we have to have informed citizens. So how do we do this? I'm going to tell a real quick story here that uh, when I went over to New Zealand uh, about a year and a half ago now, I happened to be there on a magical weekend. Uh, they had been following the same form that we did. They have their land use planners working independently. They create growth. The transportation planners come in and try to bail them out and do the best they can, but 
What that produces is the kind of growth nobody wants, wider streets, inducing more traffic, ending up with more traffic. Everybody now who works in either one of these professions knows this is broken. We can't keep doing this and expect different results. So what did they do in New Zealand the week I was there? And I had nothing to do with it. They had been planning this for 15 years. It was a coup. <laughs> On Friday afternoon, everyone who had a job in land use planning or in transportation planning got a pink slip. Told to go home. But to turn it over and read the other side. They were to come back Monday and they would have a brand new job. Everyone. And this is what they put in place. Essentially, they needed their land use planners. They needed their transportation planners. They needed them more than ever. But what they really needed was to bring them together. To put them under a new roof. Community planning. And everyone now learned to speak the same language, learned to work in unison, and was now able to build the community, to grow their economy, but to do it with the positive outcomes that everyone wanted. And it really is a simple thing. We change the institutional way of approaching things, and we get different outcomes. And with that, I want to thank uh, and uh, uh, celebrate those who, who, who brought me here tonight and uh, for all the folks that weren't here physically, uh, uh, to, to thank all of you for listening in and so on, but to keep in mind that the America that we built got us to this point, but we've run out of uh, land, of resources, and everything we do now is going to have to be more strategic, more thoughtful, more inclusive, more equitable, more everything. And once we do these things, we are going to have an economy that you cannot shut down. Thank you very much, folks. And I think we've got time for some questions and answers. Am I right? OK. Short time. Short time. OK. Questions and answers. Dan, what do you uh, see as the role of mandated uh, parking requirements uh, it's played in this over the last 40, 50 years. Right. Um, here's a, uh, a, a one of those fun little quizzes. Where did the first off-street parking get built? No, it was well before the malls. Columbus, Ohio, my birth town. And it was really built by three developers who came together and built three grocery stores in one neighborhood. So as people were coming home, they were filling up the streets. So they invented valet parking. And people would get out of their cars, go into their shoppings, and someone would drive their car behind the buildings into a parking lot. Later, Columbus codified that and said it's now required. And so future development then required off-street parking. This was back in the 1920s. And uh, over time, our engineering and planning community came up with formulas and said, well, if you happen to have a church, you have to have this much parking or if you per um, membership or whatever. And then the uh, same with a hotel, same with everything, until we have these magic formulas. And they're typically way over, uh, the, the set requirements are way beyond what's reasonable. And here's the interesting thing. For every car you park on the street, you need 150 square feet. That's not a lot of space. And uh, every car you park off street, you have to triple that. You have to have a way in, you have to have a way out, you have to have a turn radius plus the parking space. So one car off street requires 450 square feet. Now every new car that comes to your community requires nine parking spaces based on these formulas. So you take nine, just because it, math is easier, let's say it's 10. That's 4,500 square feet for each new car you introduce to your community. You don't have that kind of land. So what we're now saying is that the really smart communities are reversing the formulas. They're saying, you don't have a minimum parking requirement. You have a maximum allowed. So. Uh, 
you have a 10,000 square foot building, if you're in Australia, you may be allowed 20 parking spaces for a 10,000 square foot building. And truly, as we're doing this and we're in enhancing transit and walking and people living closer and things like that, we're finding out that the land becomes so much more valuable that we just can't afford all these off-street parking spaces and certainly not to require them. So more and more towns are, are leaving behind the, the minimum required to the maximum that you're allowed to have. And just load up the streets with parking. Yeah. Good question. Yes, sir. I live in a cul-de-sac neighborhood with a lot of green space beside the feeder road. You know, you're going down to feeder road and there's 50 or 75 feet of green and then a wall of fences. Is that space that's possible for use for in, what do you call it, in building or whatever? Infill. Infill and, and turn those into, you know, the cul-de-sac neighborhoods into villages or, you know, pockets of villages in the cul-de-sac neighborhoods? There are so many things that we're going to learn to do with our cul-de-sac neighborhoods, but it's got to come from within the neighborhood. Uh, you, you just have so many people that are, are totally invested in their neighborhood and making any changes inside is, is really challenging. Now, that's not to say that we won't end up doing it over time, but it's got to be done on a plot model or a pilot basis where, where a neighborhood or two come to us that we say, okay, we've got the funds to do these things for you, but we're going to handpick the neighborhood. And you've, the number one requirement is you have to want this, and you have to have agreement among your neighbors. Uh, we will enhance the value of your land, the quality of life, and so on, but we don't look to do that everywhere, at least not in the first or the next decade. Uh, we are finding ways that we can connect the disconnected cul-de-sac streets uh, and to do it beautifully with honor, grace, and add value to people's homes, give them more walking, more cycling, more emergency access. But these, these are really our tougher acts. We can better correct our principal roads and get those right than we can going in. Now, if there happens to be plenty of right-of-way for the principal street, uh, outside of where all the cul-de-sacs line up. And let's say it's 70 feet. We can do a lot with 70 feet of right-of-way, a huge amount, and, and bring back stores and, and other civic uses and things like that. So we are starting to, to put some projects together where we're, we're able to transform some neighborhoods, bring the trips down in, in distance, and, and, and truly add that kind of a value. And we're seeing this in Canada first, where they've been innovators, where they really want these eco-villages to work where they are getting tired of having their traffic and want some alternatives. But I think they'll, they'll come to other cities in time. Did I answer your question? It's a very complex thing to do, but uh, we have to learn to do it. Keep in mind, 80% of the built America is suburban. Something else that's happening and is happening very fast is the suburbs um, that uh, well, this was predicted a long time ago, but it's now happening, is we're seeing a reversal of populations. The children raised in the, in the suburbs are now choosing to live in more active, more vibrant uh, town centers. And they're not buying the old, older homes. Not only are we having the economic meltdown because the homes were overpriced and all kinds of other factors, but we're finding there are going to be fewer and fewer people that find these to be the right habitat. Uh, that's also true of older citizens who are realizing they don't need that much land. They don't need to be out there uh, watering and cutting grass as frequently. They need a good place to live, and they need a place where they can walk to their dentist, their doctor, or this or that. So we're seeing a reversal, but the interesting thing is, uh, and it's, it's kind of unfortunate, is those who have had the privileges of having choice taken away from them are the ones who are ending up in the suburbs and uh, we saw it first in Honolulu, where uh, many suburban homes now have two, if not three families living in a house. Massive number of the cars parked outside, uh, just different lifestyles and so on, uh, simply because in Honolulu, it's one of the only ways people can still afford to live. Uh, but we're seeing that more and more in, in select cities in the US, and I would expect a lot more of that. So one way or the other, We've got to rescue the suburbs, and what that really means 
is, is designing them or redesigning them to work for everybody and to still make uh, a good place to live, a good place to have churches and schools and things like that. But we are gonna see a huge return of people to true town centers, true villages. Uh, that movement is well underway and there's at least 20 factors of why we're gonna see that evolve very quickly. Yeah. Yes, sir. What are people doing about the uh, mega stores such as Walmart, which get so much press, and the developers that develop the large shopping centers, which um, I've seen places, uh, Winchester, Virginia has a really attractive downtown, uh, but as soon as the Walmarts went in, their businesses uh, dropped significantly. <coughs> Uh, is there a way of accommodating those that people have tried, or uh, you just have to play tough love or what? Yeah, there, there is some tough love going on with that. Uh, but one of the things I think we are going to see, and this was explained by one of the top executives of Walmart when uh, Katrina hit and they were rebuilding the Gulf Coast, he came and worked with the new urban communities that were trying to get the towns re refooted. He he helped come up with some concepts for some Walmarts that would help rebuild the towns. But one of the things he said was fairly profound. He said, Walmart is almost finished building out suburban stores. We're now going to move into the department stores. He didn't say it, but <laughs> department stores, they put out of business. And uh, because that's where the shoppers are going to be. They're going to be in downtowns. They're going to be in more concentrated areas. We're already seeing in cities like Charlotte, where the very large footprint stores, the power centers like Lowe's or Home Depot and, and other stores are now building beautifully into the neighborhoods. And they're doing it uh, where they're adding value to the neighborhoods. And, and, and truly, it's all about how you design. It's not what the store is. It, it's really does the store fit where it doesn't create this super block condition where people can come in and out of many of these stores with, with cars, walking, biking, transit, and so on. So they're building these very well in uh, some of the uh, advanced neighborhoods in places like Charlotte. So yeah, it'll be different. It'll be very different. Uh, it won't happen everywhere at the same time. Uh, an example, I live in a town that will never have a Walmart. It will never have any big box store. We're very happy to have a very healthy hardware store and a lumber store outside of town and so on. And we're willing to drive 40 minutes to the nearest town that's got a Walmart and a uh, Home Depot. And that's a, that's a choice that people in our community have made and will we'll stick with. And uh, the question might come up, well, how do you enforce that? Can't Walmart come in and build? Yeah, they can. But if, if you've got, say, a 60,000 or 80,000 square foot footprint maximum, that everybody has to comply with, and Walmart's not interested. They want 120,000 square feet or, or something. So by setting some rules and expectations based on your village, you can dictate the kinds of stores that come in and the size of stores that come in and, the, and leave the market open to more stores uh, so you don't end up with these huge footprint stores. So we're seeing some big transitions in the uh, power centers to where they're going to be more like your town center. Uh, you've got some pretty good sized stores there, right? Dick's and uh, Best Buy and a few others. And they fit. And uh, they're not always the right pattern that you want, but they're coming very close to, to what the future really is. Okay. This gentleman, uh, you'll be the last, uh, just because of time, we're going to shut down at nine. <laughs> emphasized in your talk things like um, increased density, villages, mixed use. How, is light, light, how does light rail fit in with this? If we're at a crossroads right now at Virginia Beach, you know, light rail, high speed, whatever. Um, it would appear that to meet those kinds of things, light rail would be very conducive to, to creating all of those things that would in fact, give us complete streets, uh, better situations traffic-wise, and would solve some of the problems that we're 
um, facing right now as a city, trying to grow and, and get new business and do some of the better things to make this a better city to, quote, age in place? Yep. Um, perfect question to ask as the, our final question tonight. I want to say that uh, light rail will never pay for itself. But what it will do is set the stage for land use that makes truly billions of dollars. So everywhere you put in a station, if you design correctly, and do the right things, you can, uh, as past experience has proven, bring in a billion dollars here, a billion dollars to the next station, two billion at one of them, this and that. And it's just, that's what light rail does. It makes it easy to build all the right plazas and open space and buildings, residential, office towers, everything you want within walking distance of the light rail station. That's that five minute walk and that's where you want that concentration around that light rail. Then you want another five minutes of walk so you're now out ten minutes from the absolute center of the station. You lighten your density, you go down, you stage down but you still have pretty good density. You might have, instead of a uh, uh, single family residential, typically has been coming in at one to three units per acre. More historic and walkable, six to seven units per acre. That's what walkable is, six or seven units per acre. And then you get inside this 10 minute radius, and now you're up to 11 to 22 uh, units per acre. And then you get to the heart, the very center, the five minute walk and you're up to 60 or 80 or 90 or 110 units per acre. That's what truly pencils out, gives you maximum ridership, maximum return on investments on your light rail and maximum value of your land. The cool thing is, as you go beyond that 10 minute walk, all homes are worth more money. And actually, the closer they are to that 10 minute radius line, the more they're worth. Because you can choose to have a single family unit and walk 10 minutes to a light rail, five minutes to many good stores. Um, and uh, so that's truly where we're gonna see a, a, a wonderful return on investment. So you're gonna pay big bucks for your light rail. You have to, but you're gonna see the most incredible return. And then of course with that, a reduction on how many people get in their cars to go somewhere uh, and sit in their car for 20 minutes or 30 minutes just to get to a store that uh, is as, as close as they want to live to that store. They're going to be able to walk to many of them, bike to them, or uh, uh, simply drive a much, much shorter distance to get to these great centers. So you're doing the right thing in the right time. Your timing is impeccable. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it.